on. Um, we're going to talk about how bloggers and podcasters can take their work and convert that into uh, books because uh, publishing works that way today. A little bit about us. Me, I'm Evo Terra. You see me up here. I'm Jeff Moyari. And I guess that's one of the short versions of the bio. No, I just want to know. Oh, okay. If you would do what I pointed out. I'm usually trained. And collectively, we have a company called ePublish Unum. I'll give you a quick background about me, and we'll go back to that. So I've been involved in the digital publishing space since around 2002. Actually, let me back up on that one. I've been working with authors since about 2002. I've been involved in the digital space since about 1999. Um, and in that time, I've seen quite a few things happen. When, when I jumped into publishing, uh, e-books, for all points and purposes, didn't really exist, or they were so rare that it was, um, well, nobody would read them. Well, well before Amazon's Kindle, well before the explosion of e-books had taken place. Uh, I've also been involved in podcasting for a very long time. I was one of the one of the earliest podcasters, number 40, uh, by measurements uh, by Podcast Alley, back in October 14, 2004. And I had a radio show that we had turned into a podcast because that was very easy to do, interviewing authors, which is how I kind of got my start in that. I, I've written a couple of books in the For Dummies series, such as three books, three different ISB numbers that have my name on the spine of them, all the W series, all about podcasting. So I've been down the, the traditional publishing road, worked with a lot of authors in the digital publishing road um, as well. And Jeff and I got together before we published them about, about a year ago uh, to help educate authors, but enough about me and that question. Talk about you, Jeff. So, yeah, my name is um, I come at it from the opposite side of you know, the writing side. I'm dealt with a lot of different formats, screenplays, short fiction, nonfiction, and kind of playing around for you know. Bottom line, I love to help people get their ideas out for one another. It's called Phoenix, which gives people a platform to get up and talk, getting people uh, the ability to platform, stage, and share their ideas is what I really enjoy. So that meshes well with what Evo does on the publishing side. Uh, in really taking advantage of this digital publishing change that the industry is going through to let individual people claim their own spot on the stage and get their material out there. Right, and that's the purpose behind you publishing a quick sales pitch about us. We teach people how to be authors in the digital world. That's our article tagline is we help authors survive and thrive in a digital world. Sometimes it's authors who never knew they wanted to be an author before, but the digital world enables that. Many times it's who have been writing for, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 years, how yeah. long have you been doing that, um, and come to us and say, how can you guys help me get further in this new digital space? Not just from a publishing point of view, but doing everything uh, in, in an online world. So, that's what we do, um, and we think this stuff is pretty critical for a, a couple of key reasons. First off, I mentioned earlier that ebooks didn't used to be anything. Ebooks are now huge. Ebooks are huge. Um, as you can see by this slide, this is the first half of 2012. 34% growth in the ebook market, $621 million of revenue generated off of ebooks. At a time when print books, paper, only grew by 2%. So the book market's thriving and growing. It's just where it, the, the thriving and growing is happening is all really focused in on, on those, those ebooks. Yeah, now, if you look at the specific areas here, Business and investing, that topic alone, if you look in the past 30 days on Amazon.com, 2,600 titles. Small business and entrepreneurship, 442. So it's not just fiction, it's not just big name authors releasing their content on ebooks. Um, there's a lot of new content that's coming out there, niche focus, specialty, individual stuff. So the question is, what are you good at? You know, and, and what kind of book do you want to write? You don't have to be great. Uh, you know, big uh, novel or next cheap um, soft porn. Uh, <laughs> it's a shade of green. Oh, that yeah. He blocks it out. He's, he's in a state of denial about that particular series. But you don't have to write something like that. Whatever your focus is, there's a market for it. And that's one of the reasons we're talking to about this talk here is many bloggers and podcasters already have a wealth of knowledge, and so we're going to help you get that stuff out. But it's good for us to explain that you know, what we're talking about is a 
from a book today is very different than what books were 10 years ago. In many ways, they're the same. I mean, we are, we are still buying hard books, and we are still putting them in our bookshelf. But they don't all look like this anymore. Now, books fit on these devices. Like, almost every single one of us in here is probably carrying a device that probably even has an ebook on it. We can read them that way. Um, they are no longer gigantic, really, really big things. Sometimes they're very small. Uh, small in length, not only small in file size. They do not have to be six, seven hundred page uh, works of art. And, uh, PDFs. Touch on this. Technically, PDF is a, we can they call it an ebook format. And uh, there was a big craze, of course, since it sort of died down, for everybody and their brother to have download my free ebook in my PDF format from my website. And I know this because every time I follow someone on Twitter, I get a DM from them telling me this. Um, really, we're not talking about that. If you want to put a white paper or something like that available for download on your website, great. But ebooks, we're talking about a EPUB, a Mobi format, downloading from Amazon.com or one of the major marketplaces. They also don't have to be, to the film idea, uh, huge cross topics. They can be a single topic. A single book, a single uh, thing you want to focus on uh, is a fantastic. Uh, a fantastic opportunity. Uh, the series of Wool. 10,000 words, 99 cents. He put it up there. Uh, he had a crane he threw it out, and then he took off so fast he wrote four more. At one point, he had three of the top ten um, most popular short books on Amazon.com, and I remember Hugh Holly, the author, and uh, has made a boatload of money and has uh, the books have now been optioned for a movie. So there's a huge demand for short topic books. People have a short attention span, they want information quick, they don't have to write something that can make it work. So yes, you can write one as well. If you're one topic that you're an expert in, write a book on By the way, if there's any questions come up to this, just feel free to, to ask away. We Jeff and I like to be interrupted in my kind of conversation. We may tell you, hold on, it's coming into a slide, but we also may not. So <coughs> interrupt with anyone. <laughs> Sure. Uh, already know, um, have published a, uh, a book already, have a book up on Amazon.com or the marketplace. Who is, who is working on one right now? <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm curious, why, are you, are you not sure if you're working on it? I don't know if I want other people to see it. Oh, no, that's fair, okay. Yes, exactly. But you're working on it, okay. All right, I'm curious how you didn't know if you're working on it. You <laughs> wake up in the morning like, what happened last night? <laughs> <laughs> so the very first class Jeff and I put together as part of the publishing was focused on this concept of using the stuff that you've already created. If you're a blogger, if you're a podcaster, if you're doing anything. I mean, you have talked about white papers earlier. Those, not, those aren't ebooks, but that's great fodder to begin the process. We like this concept of using the things that we make because many people are, are content creators these days doing things all day long to generate content, uh, that content can be put inside of a book form with a relative ease. Right? So that, that's our, our big message here today is use, don't start from the blank page, start with the stuff that you've already done. If you're, if you're blogging, go look through your blog posts. Uh, it is not as simple as copy, paste, upload to Amazon, I published a book. People do that, and that's unfortunate. But it is a place for you to start looking. If you're a hardcore blogger and every day or every couple of days you're putting a blog post up and you're getting a lot of engagement, mine that content. Find what you have that is worthwhile and that's a good place to start from. Get rid of the stuff that doesn't really match if you've been writing about you know, children's literature for most of the time, but every other so every so often you post about your your grandma's favorite apple pie recipes, those probably don't mix together. But what's fine on a blog is not necessarily going to in a book. So make sure you're mining through your content. get it all together, <coughs> you, need to, you need to build a flow. A lot of times if you're blogging and creating content sort of that hot, or something to use, or something to catch your fans, you're making content about it. You put it together, in hindsight it may not, it may be really just joint. So get it organized, classify it, you didn't really have a good way of organizing it, really understand what you have. Um, and look for where you, as you, you know, kind of a, a very old post of yours might be the first one you use, and that might be kind of followed by something you're newer. What are the gaps in your in your content? Maybe something that kind of bridges 
between two different areas uh, that you want to, you need to fill in something new that you're going to create that is new to build. Joining things together is a key portion of this because blog posts have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and they're all said and done with, but a, but a book needs to tell a continual narrative throughout that one. So look for those little joiners that you can put at the end of a chapter that says, next week, well, it wouldn't say next week, it would say, in the next chapter, here's what we're going to cover, or provide some synopsis of the things that they've done, uh, or perhaps just roll up everything they're learning so far, kind of teasing into the area that they're going to. At the beginning of your sections, then you can do a recap of what they've learned before, and you can say, building on that which we learned in chapters one and three, this time we're going to talk about this, if it's a how-to book. But figure out ways to, to join in each of those pieces. They're very separate right now because somebody only going to come back, come back to your site once every couple of days to read your blog post. Someone's going to sit in one full reading now, perhaps, and in fact, they probably will because we're talking about a short book, we're not talking about a 60,000 word document. They'll probably read the whole thing consecutively, so I'll make sure that it flows all the way through. Do the last one? All right. Yeah, you do the last one. All right, I'm going to hop on my soapbox for this one. <laughs> Tell a story. And you know, I come from the, the writing storytelling side, and I think this is a really <laughs> uh, extremely common mistake when people take content they had and dump it out there. Hey, this was all interesting and really to fit. This is all fascinating to me. What? What? No. People are storytellers. You respond to story. Even even non-fiction information. You want something that builds. We want something that engages us. We want something that has some sort of a connection. It's fundamental aspects of storytelling that will go a long, long way, I think are ins- essential for really having a good story. <coughs> so whatever your content is, after you've organized it, after you piece it together, after you kind of bridge technically all the little pieces, figure out what is your story? What are you telling someone? Why is someone going to care? Not that you necessarily have to have you know, <coughs> come back to battles and antagonists and on the news and, and everything else, uh, but you still need to understand what the point is, what is the tale that you're trying to tell. You can't answer that for your own content. Right? Anyone reading your book is going to wonder the same thing. Well, what is the story here? What is the point? Is this just a collection of this? So build a story, fiction, nonfiction, whatever you're writing, figure out what your story is and put your content under that envelope. If your content doesn't support your story, cut it out. Right? Be ruthless with that editing. Make sure your, your story is cohesive, it's compelling, it engages, that people who are reading your book are going to respond to it, and they're going to recommend it. This was great. I couldn't put it down. Storytelling. Don't forget it. So what we're doing in this first slide here is this is the, the, the writing phase. We, we have five pages in the public, and we're going to cover them all here. But this was writing. The good news for you is chances are you already have most of the writing done. We just need you to make this finish the writing. <coughs> pieces lined up uh, in a way that it makes, it makes good sense, right? When you're doing that, as we said before, you know, we're, we're, we're all working with the things that you already have, the blog posts that, that exist, that you've already done before. Um, but let's, let's talk about length. We're talking about writing a short ebook. We're talking about 10,000 words. <coughs> blog posts aren't that way. Maybe you're starting with really compelling tweets you Okay, why not? I suppose that could actually work. And you've got to fill up an entire book. Well, we're talking about a short book. We're talking about 10,000 words. That's not a huge amount. If you were able to write 500 words at a time, which is not an insurmountable number, you could write 500 words on a daily basis. If you're five days a week, you have 10,000 words written in a month. Simple math. It's not that hard to do. And I think get in the habit of writing, you're going to get closer to your content, you're going to be more engaged with it and have a better uh, product in the end. So even if you have a lot of that content done, writing on a daily basis is going to serve you well. Now, one of the big traps that people fall into is working on your book versus working. Right? They're going to be probably at the same desk where you do whatever your other job is. You've got a million distractions. Uh, you're going to be using Word or whatever tool you write blog posts or anything else in, there's not a mental dividing line to say, hey, I am actually working and devoting time to working on this book. I highly recommend finding, amongst other things, a different tool. 
know, I also am a big fan of, especially for writing, finding a certain time of the day and a whole bunch of writing techniques where I can get into. But if you get a different tool, it can really help you focus because, well, first, I'm not of the opinion that Word is the best tool out there for writing ebooks anyway. Um, you know, we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But there's better tools like Scrivener. I'm a big fan of, of Scrivener personally. It is a uh, like 50 bucks, and it is organized for writers. So rather than just having one big page, every chapter or section that you write is essentially on a large like note card. And you can organize those, you can easily drag and drop. If you want to decide this chapter goes here, boop, you're done. You reorder it. And then when you press publish, it generates um, the book in whatever format you laid it out in. It covers a lot of presets, like exporting an EPUB and other things as well. It's a very different way of writing. It has a full screen mode. If you go full screen, it blocks out all of your desktop and everything else. So all you're looking at is your document. It helps eliminate the screen action. I like Evernote, personally. Um, I, I do a lot of note taking inside of Evernote. Uh, so if you're, I probably wouldn't use it to write a book because I use it so much as a productivity tool. But it's fantastic <coughs> because if you are in a situation where you can't really write at work because, you know, you're writing at work and they would get, maybe you get in trouble for that, but maybe you do have some time during your lunch break and you don't want to save the documents in the back and forth, you never know. It sticks up between all of your computer devices. Or if you've got a tablet or even on, you know, your mobile phone, you can actually write inside of that. You never know. We'll grab all that. It, it really doesn't matter. These are two tools. There are dozens of tools out there. The key takeaway from this is writing something different. Hell, write it long form if it's what you need to do on a big legal pad or post-it notes. I don't care. Make your brain switch from doing the thing that you do, blogging, podcasting, working, whatever else, to writer mode and just do something different. Uh, all right. So now you uh, have your writing done. The next phase we're going to talk about is uh, editing. Um, writing is rewriting. When you get all your content done, you're going to go back and prune it and clean it, prune it some more and clean it, and you're going to think it's absolutely polished and perfect, and you are going to be wrong. <laughs> you are going to completely miss something that someone else is going to point out to you, and you're going to go, son of a, there's no way that was in there. Yes, it's true. We can't, our, the way our brains are wired, we're really bad about seeing our own errors and stuff like this. You're going to need help. Uh, editing, especially bringing someone in, bringing in a professional, uh, the different types of editors, all the way from just having, you know, don't just have your, your wife or your husband or your mom just kind of proofread this. You need somebody with more experience. Plus, of course, your mom, husband, or wife is a professional proofreader, then perfectly fine. Yeah, so really that's not the case. So if you, you, right now, you leave here, you go marry a proofreader, you're going to save a lot of money <laughs> for a professional career. That'd be most of the day. Right, so. <laughs> Find someone. There's a lot of places online you can go and, uh, and, and look. And you've got something that's linked again of uh, oh yeah, like editing and, and stuff like that. Search for proofreads of different groups, uh, a lot of different rates. I think it's probably about uh, $500 or so. Uh, rule of thumb for uh, getting somebody to come in and do your uh, do a professional editing job. Oh, sure. Yes. Uh, the other piece that you need that you can't do is the design work. Your book needs a cover. Books believe it or not, are judged by their cover. It happened for the last few years. You can't believe that old man is still out there because it happens all the time. You should not design your own book cover. Even if you are a designer, I do not think you should design your own book cover. You are too close to it. Get someone else, probably someone who knows what they're doing, um, and have them create a real compelling cover for you. I see authors fight covers all the time and say, I can do it myself, and they seems like they pull that MS Paint in a cheap font package and person it looks that way. Um, you, you really, really need to do this. Jeff mentioned 500 bucks for, for a proofreader. That's not a bad number to budget. You can find it for more or less for cover design um, as well. But at the end of the day, you want things to look really, really good. And when people start reading it, you don't want stupid errors that are in the way of that. And let me give you a, a, a very good real-world case to do. If you go and, and search for a site called why is my book not selling? I think it's booknotselling.blogspot.com. It's a place where authors can post their books. The, this site asks a submission form and it asks for, send us your cover, send us the first 500, 300 words of your book, 
uh, and send us the sales copy that you have listed on Amazon.com. And they get posted up there, it goes to the public, and an editor comes through and gives critique and commentary, and other people come through and give critique and commentary. Uh, I'm amazed every time I look at that, because just by looking at the cover and reading those first 300 words, the question has been answered. <laughs> That's why your book is not selling. It looks terrible, and in those first 300 words, I know you are a fool. That you, that you didn't bother to even think about subject perpetrator. It's just really, really not good. So use that site for inspiration of what not to do. It's also kind of amazing that people are still using blog sites. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have the link, but it's so why is my book not selling? Look it up. It's a blog uh, spot. Would, would you uh, watch a blog spot? All right, how to publish. Writing, editing, publishing. Step three. Yep. So, there's a lot of ways you can do this, from uh, getting them in the hood and doing it yourself, to paying money for someone else to do it for you. We're going to sit through the spectrum. Step one, caliber. So, calibre, pronounced caliber. This is a free tool, a great tool, for managing your ebook library. It will connect your devices, and it will find new covers, and you can use the project Gutenberg, and it can bring all kinds of free ebooks. Great tool. If you're an ebook collecting nerd, you'll want to use it. No. Yes. Uh, it has one very specific feature for which it is exceptionally well known, and that's the ability to convert between different formats. Between ones that may or may not have copy protection or DRM on them. So, uh, what you can do is take, if you're writing in Word, which again we don't advise for purposes here, export uh, from Word uh, into HTML and import that into Calibre. Caliber will create a EPUB or Mobi or just about any other format of ebook under the sun for you. Now, it will be um, it will be a homegrown version and it won't be perfect. Uh, there's another tool that I uh, to add to this slide called uh, Sigil, S-I-G-I-L, and that is a tool for micro editing uh, EPUB files and can run a validation. So what will happen is you'll run Caliber, you'll give it EPUB file, so stick it in the sigil. So, boop, you've got these three errors. And go, Son of a, and you go back to Word and try to fix them because it says your picture was formatted wrong or your table of contents was messed up. And then you export it, re-import it, do it, and check it. You've got to run this process a few times. You can do it. There are authors who have run, used Calibre to publish their e-books, but you, uh, it's not hard. You do have to run the ropes, and it takes a little bit of uh, elbow grease. Any users of uh, WordPress in the audience? <laughs> Pressbooks. Pressbooks is built completely on WordPress. So if you like using WordPress as your blogging platform, consider using Pressbooks as your ebook creation platform. Posts, pages, all the things that you're used to doing, that's how you build your book. It was uh, built by a guy, uh, Hugh McGuire. He started a company called LibriVox way back in the day. Really, really smart guy. Uh, I'm, I'm proud to know him, and he really gives back to the Pressbooks. Pressbooks, when you are finished, it helps kind of walk you through some other concepts we're not really talking about here, things called front matter and back matter, which sounds really scary, but it's pretty simple. Walk you through all that, you've got a book, you push a button, and it automatically creates an EPUB file for you. It can also distribute those EPUB files to various marketplaces, and I think the best of all, it actually gives you a website for your book. Not a book about, a website about your book, but it converts your e-book give a URL out if you'd like to give that book away free for people to read. So again, the definition of a book is changing. Giant fan of questions. Which one do you want to cover next? All I'm going to do is book baby. Yeah, book baby. So if you know CD Baby, if you're an independent musician, you probably know CD Baby. Book Baby is the exact same thing by the exact same people. Send them your file. Uh, you can send them a Word document. They'll handle the conversion for you in an automated way, and they will distribute the file out for you. They take a certain amount of Proceeds, I think it's 99 bucks, and, and they'll do the work for you. Uh, if, if you want someone else to do it for you, check out Book Baby, um, and I'll talk about Smashwords. You do the rest. Of it. Okay. And then Smashwords is probably the place where indie authors go. It's, it's, uh, it's probably the, the, the biggest collection right now outside of the, the Kindles of the world. The great thing about Smashwords is that it's got this tool called the Meet Grinder, and you upload your Word, your Word doc, not your docx file, but your .doc file, 
Uh, you load that up there, the meat grinder does its thing, and it converts it automatically into all those formats that Kyle work can and a whole lot more. It also, by the smash word, like both maybe in press books, can handle the distribution without taking a small portion of your fees. Um, but the nice thing about the, uh, the Smashwords uh, model is it lets you sell the book for free on Smashwords, Amazon, and today Barnes & Noble don't like to do that very much. So if you just want to give the book away to try and get some exposure, it's a great place. And it's, it's created quite a marketplace of people who know they'll get real raw indie authors uh, at, at Smashwords more so than what they'll find in the big houses. So check out Smashwords. We like it. Uh, Kindle Direct Publishing, KDP, from Amazon.com. Uh, you give Amazon your book. They will, uh, you can upload all kinds of crazy stuff there, and they will chew through it, and um, you will have it available in the Amazon web store, the marketplace. Uh, Amazon has 70-some percent of the market. So if you put it there, you have the lion's share all by yourself is doing that one particular move. There's a lot of reasons why that thing is not. Care for them, it's a cool, uh, cool. Uh, but that is one place you can go biggest bang for the buck, uh, like right there. And then of it from Barnes & Noble. You know, uh, Amazon still dominates, but Barnes & Noble has a pretty significant uh, piece here, so you can do the same. Uh, that's the marketplace equivalent of, of Kindle uh, marketplace on uh, Barnes & Noble. The key takeaway here is there's no silver bullet. Right? This space is still forming. There's still a lot of weird stuff going on. There's not one easy thing to do. Everything here has advantages and disadvantages. It depends entirely on what you want to do, what you feel comfortable with. So that was writing, that was editing, that was publishing. So you're done, right? No. <laughs> you are not done. Uh, we have very short attention spans in this world. But, and thank you. We need constantly. So pimping and promoting, so we wrap up our final two stages of publishing um, in, in this one, and it is basically that. It's, it's promoting, and it's also interacting with, with, with the people that are out there. But you have to do this. You can't just assume that you publish a book and, it, and everything is fine. That doesn't work anymore. It, you have to give some numbers of how many new books in a couple of very small niches are published each and every month. You are a small fish in a really, really big pond. You need to make a to promote yourself as we say. We think the best way for you to do that is to use your network. If you're a blogger or you're a podcaster, that means that you have listeners and or you have readers or viewers, if it's in video. Use those people. Use them. Even though they've consumed your content for free, because everything that you're going to put in this book they've already heard, yeah, well, maybe not. Not necessarily. People like the convenience of having it all in one place. Sometimes they simply want it as a souvenir. Sometimes they want to do it to support you and the things that you do, and then they can also share to other people that they can't get to listen to a podcast or read a blog, maybe they can get them to a book. Use the network that you have. And encourage discussion. People talking about your book. I'm going to draw other people going, ooh, look at what's going on. Get them, whether it's on your site, whether it's on uh, you know, Amazon.com, wherever there's discussion going on, encourage it and respond and engage. Days are long gone where the, uh, well, unless you're a big name, kind of old school author where you can just kind of take a book out and never interact. E ebook authors, people, your fans are going to want to talk to you. They're going to want to hear what you have coming up next. They want to ask questions about your book, you know, alternatives, and they're going to, you know, Dan, what are you wearing right now? I am wearing a cracker shirt. He was uh, studying about that stuff in the combo book. Exactly. So you're going to get people who uh, engage and want to interact with all different kinds of levels. And encourage that. Talk to them. I mean, those people care about the stuff that you're making, so uh, make sure that you're a part of that process. And in keeping up to date with them, look at, you know, whether you're blogging or using video already, mailing lists, they're still powerful things. Find ways to keep connecting with your fans. Let them know what's coming along. How's the next, you know, if, if you follow remotely, Scott Sigler, Try not knowing exactly where he is with all his different projects. <laughs> You're going to know. And he's very, very good about communicating that information. Last piece of this, highly important. You've got to write another book. If you just write one book, you'll have a sales cycle and it will go away. But people like to be fed constant things. So don't follow my path. 
of writing a couple of dummy books and being done with the writing thing. But remember, my goal was never to be an author. It just kind of fell on my lap and I said, eh, the book's going to sell itself. I don't have to work a whole lot at it. But I learned a lot through that process. But assuming you want to be an author and you like this process and you want to continue, and also assuming that you're a, broadcast, a broadcaster or a broadcaster, a podcaster or a blogger or a video producer, you're generating content all the time. Put this as one more piece every three months you'd be picking out a new book. And I'm not kidding. That's not an unrealistic number, especially in collecting short e-books at a time. You can go really, really fast. Keep writing. All right. And what we do. So if you uh, kind of blew through a lot of these steps at a very high level, you know, if you want more, we can help. Uh, we have a, a program called Quick in the Red that is focused specifically on short e-books and getting them up for sale. This isn't just more info. By the end of it, we want you to hit publish and be online selling your book. So there's lots of places you can get general information if you want somebody to actually kind of look through very specifically at your book uh, and how we can how we can be more effective online. Let us know. Four weeks to finish is similar but for larger books. We have a novel, a 70,000 word book that's done. Again, we're not here to help you finish writing. We're here to help you get it up in the marketplace. Then we can help you with that as well. And we also do uh, private consultation and just kind of help people with the books uh, in, in general through the process. So while this is our sales pitch slide, we, let's reinforce this. Everything we're talking about is DIY. There's nothing special that we have, just you know, knowledge of the process and more importantly, maybe a little ass kicking to keep you moving in the right direction. And if you want to pay us to do that, pick it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're very good. They're very good. Um, one of the points on here uh, I'm about to make is, you know, there's very good reasons that you might want to go and pay someone to uh, help you out, right? Whether it's skill or time or anything else, but you can do it all yourself. Uh, this stuff is just—it's huge, but it's really just getting going. To me, I look at digital publishing the way social slash new media was about five years ago. There were all these different things, and then something new was popping up overnight. Like, Claire, what is this? I don't tweet. You know, it's just crazy. No one knows where it's going to go. That's where we're at right now. But it is not going anywhere. It's not a trend. It's not a fad. Um, and this should be something you should consider as a publication channel for whatever your business ideas are. For the extension, you know, take your existing content, repurpose it, refine it. Don't look at this as something you have to start from scratch. What are you already talking about that's good, that's media, that's interesting to someone? So those are kind of the primary takeaways. You probably wrote lots of notes down, and, and we hope that you did. Uh, you can find out more about us at epublishunum.com, and we're happy to take any questions that you guys might have. And, uh, kind of lead the direction. Yes, sir. This might be a little too technical.